All right, Entree Architect community, it's 4 p.m. Eastern, which means it's time for the Entree Architect Context and Clarity Live conversation. This is our 100th Context and Clarity Live. Welcome. Glad you are here today. When you get here, say hi. Let us know that you're here and let us know where here is for you. Where are you joining this conversation from? If we've never met before, my name is Jeff. I'm in Indianapolis, and I come here every weekday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern for one reason, so that we can find clarity around the things that matter most to you. The architect doesn't matter if you're the employee of a firm or you own your own firm. Maybe you've circled a date on the calendar. You said, hey, 2023 is my year, and I'm going to start my own thing. Or maybe you started your own thing a year ago or 10 years ago or 27 years ago, and you're starting to rethink or reimagine what that firm could or maybe even should be. All of the topics that we cover, one topic every day, they all fall under the broad umbrella of the business of architecture, and they're all the need-to-know topics for the success of entrepreneur architects just like you. So thanks for joining us today. As usual, for these Context and Clarity Live conversations, I am joined by Catherine McVale. Hi, Catherine. Hello, Jeff. A hundred times. I know we, we just talked about how it's not actually a hundred for each of us. Particularly. Yeah, it's, but it, it is a hundred times, and I'm just as nervous as the first time. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no reason to be nervous. We're, we've got no, this I'm down. Really We're good to go. Yeah, and we've got a very special guest today we for do. our hundredth as well. So we'll get into that in just a minute. I'm looking at the screen right now, and I see Erica Spade. Looks like she's in first, which means that she is the winner of the John Kenny Memorial Crocheted Bathtub Award for today. The 100th Crocheted Bathtub Award. Congratulations, Erica. Glad you're here. Kurt's joining us from Flint, Michigan over on Twitch. Uh, Scott Thrift is in San Francisco. Let's see, 70 degrees and not a cloud. Wow. He says, Mother Nature is messing with me in San Francisco. Yeah, it's been a ride out there. Glad you're safe. Glad you're with us today from LinkedIn. Scott, Ed Shannon from Des Moines, Iowa on Facebook. Erica wants to know if she gets a crocheted bathtub on her first day of her new job. She does. You do. That's exciting. Is, is that today? That's why I was, yes. <laughs> I think so. Nice. That's why I think that's why she's excited. I think that's the question. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Yes, you do. Congratulations on both accounts. Christian, welcome back from Ithaca, New York, and Jessica from Los Angeles. Um, Chris Novelli, he says, hello from the highway in New Hampshire. All right. Welcome back, Chris. And now I've got uh, a song stuck in my head. <laughs> Go ahead and sing it if you want. Christian says it's nice to have another core, how do you say that? Cornelian for the 100th. We'll, uh, we'll learn more about that here momentarily. Arturo, welcome back from San Diego. And um, anybody else, if you're out there, if you're commenting away and you say, hey, why are my uh, comments not showing up on the screen like Erica's are, or like Arturo's are, or like Ed's are? Well, the answer to that is probably because you are in a closed Facebook group right now, and there are rules. Uh, Facebook will not let your name, your likeness, your comments out unless you give permission. And so if you want to give permission for Facebook to post your comments here, go to the URL that is in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen right now. I would recommend opening another browser window and typing chat dot restream dot io slash fb like facebook that's chat dot restream dot io slash fb like facebook and a couple of clicks later all of your problems will be solved and hopefully your your comments will be showing up on the screen so uh, give that a try if that is happening with you but um, great to have all of you with us today and um, those that are still to come and are watching uh, a replay version of this, still say hi. Let us know that you're here. Go down to the comments, say, hey, I'm here, and say, where here is? Where are you? Where in the world are you? Great to have you with us for this very special mm-hmm. episode today, number 100 of Context and Clarity Live. And a change for this week. Usually, we stock the green room with candy. We had some pastries a couple of weeks ago, but maybe this becomes a new mm-hmm. trend. We have stocked the green room with ice cream today, and ice I like cream. that. I like ice cream a lot. So our guest requested butter pecan ice cream. That's what's in the green room today. It means we probably ought to get delicious. to our guests pretty soon before all the ice cream melts. Um, but uh, butter pecan ice cream in the green room today. That's exciting. I like pecan. that. Butter pecan. Is that how you say it? Butter pecan. I'm saying pecan. 
How's that? Pecan. As a kid from Georgia that still doesn't know how to, uh, how to pronounce pecan, the pecan. word. Pecan. It's pecan, isn't it? Pecan. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I it's, have no It's a idea. tasty ice cream, though. It is. It is. We're just, we're just rolling with the ice cream. That's all. All right. Our guest today is an architect a leader, and a visionary. She's a firm principal, a past president of the National Organization of Minority Architects, and will be the 100th president of the American Institute of Architects. As the 100th, she'll be only the seventh woman to be president, the first black woman to be president, and the first from the millennial generation to be president. She asks us to envision new possibilities and focuses on supporting architects in practice, creating a sense of belonging, ensuring access to the architectural profession and education, addressing climate concerns and designing for the future, considering rapid technological advances. Kimberly Dowdell, welcome to Context and Clarity Live. Thank you so much. It's great to have you here. It's good to be here, especially for your 100th. Congratulations to you. Thank you. Thank you for that. And congratulations Mm -hmm. to you on being the 100th and... What we talked about before we get started, the 10-year anniversary of passing your last uh, section of the ARE today. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Mm. Yes, March 16th, 2013 is a very memorable day because had I not passed that day, I actually would have had to start all over because of the rolling clock. Oh, wow. Um, But uh, thankfully, NCARB actually changed that policy recently. Um, It hasn't hit all jurisdictions yet, but we're uh, actively working with our partners uh, throughout the industry to, to make sure that that happens. So, um, so it's awesome. a milestone that I'm exactly, you know, that I'm excited about, but also um, interested in helping to, to make more, po- make possible for more people. Yeah. Yeah. So I asked the hard hitting question. So my question for you is, uh, what did you leave for last? Which section? Which section did you leave for last? Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. It, it cut out for a little bit, so I couldn't yeah, hear. But yeah. um, the last section was building design and construction systems. Uh, All right. Well, that, that's well, that's a really, passed. yeah, that, that's a really timely um, uh, anniversary, I guess, because of that rolling clock issue. You know, I think that's a great illustration that if you if you hadn't that that's I, I don't know if everybody it's it's been all over. Uh, social media and articles and everything about the in carb, um, what removing the rolling clock, I guess. Um, I don't know if anybody uh, identified with that issue as closely as you do, or you did because of that situation. I mean, that's, to me, that's, that's kind of bonkers to think that had you not passed on, you know, 10 years ago. Right yeah, now exactly. Yeah, episode. that's, that's really crazy. Guest, wow. yeah, it's pretty crazy, yeah. but yeah, here we are. Well, I'm glad here you we did. are. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <Me too. laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, congratulations on that. Thank um, you. so you know, in the introduction, I, I rattled off all, all of these things that, that kind of come together in you the 100th, the, the seventh woman, the first black woman, the first millennial, all of those things. Obviously, that well, I, maybe I shouldn't say obviously, but I think that that probably gives you a pretty unique perspective coming into the position of the president of the American Institute of Architects. What's, what, what's on your mind as you head towards what inauguration would be in December of this year, right? December 15th. December 15th. So um, what goes through your mind, you know, with, with that particular perspective, as you get ready to take over from, from Emily, who Emily Grandstaff Rice, we had uh, her as our guest back in December. I think it was right after, um, I think the week after the inauguration for, for her tenure. What goes through your mind as you're thinking about all of those mantles that you're carrying, but also your vision for being this next and, and 100th president? Yeah. Um, you know, I think about the fact that I didn't get here alone and, you know, I, I have so many, um, you know, people to, to thank for their support, um, you know, mentorship, sponsorship, guidance, all kinds of things, you know, Emily included in that for sure. But, you know, the other presidents of the AIA, um, you know, from all different, different varieties of types of people, um, the former presidents of NOMA, um, you know, certainly my firm has been super supportive. So that's the first thing that's just a, a sincere, um, sincere gratitude for, uh, for all of that. Um, but also thinking about, um, 
you know, the folks who've not yet decided to become an architect, hmm. uh, the young people who are on the fence, or maybe they don't know about it yet. And hopefully, you know, as a profession, we'll do more to get the word out. But those who are on the fence, how do we make sure that we get them to choose architecture and stay in architecture? So talent, attraction and retention is something that, um, mm -hmm. that I think a lot about. Um, and I think about ways that we can, you know, really promote the work that we do and the value that we create so that we can um, really get the, the greatest talent that's out there. Because I like to say architects can see the future and help our clients create a better one. But it is a somewhat unique skill set to be able to, you know, to some extent, see the future and then articulate it and draw. I mean, like, that's fairly rare. Like, most people can't do what we do. Um, right. And we have to acknowledge that and it needs to be valued more. And But I also, I think, um, making sure that young people see this as an, as an option um, as early as possible and then cultivating that talent to really um, help our, our profession become even greater. So those are those are things kind of look, thinking about the past and the folks who have gotten me to this point, but then also what can I do, um, you know, among others to to help those who are coming behind us. Yeah, yeah, I love that. And, and as I mentioned in the introduction, one of the things that you focused on is is sort of accessibility of of education and the profession. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I've I've been teaching. Uh, for a handful of years now. And one thing that's really touched me is, you know, we, we talk a lot about path, path to licensure. Um, you know, that that's a term that's, that's all over the profession. And I, I you know, I, I prefer a different term. I think path to the profession is something that I prefer, not, not trying to diminish licensure for any reason uh, or, or at all, but I see so many people that that accessibility issue is real. You know, whether it it's the cost of school, the length of school, the, you know, all the things that go into it. So, you know, I, I assume that your passion for that is probably based on your experience in some way. But but as we as we think about that accessibility, what do you think is is really important for us to address? And, you know, you know, maybe in the next five years or something like that. Yeah, well, as I alluded to just um, just before, um making sure young people know what architecture and you know know what architects do know what architecture is about as early as possible so i'm, yeah. I'm talking like k through 12 education um mm -hmm. empowering you know our architecture centers around the country and, and even globally to find ways to get content into kids hands so uh, actually yesterday um, i visited the iida's uh, headquarters here in chicago and they had a book signing for a kids book uh, mm -hmm. called design your world and um, you know, I talked to, uh, to to someone there uh, who who said, yeah, you know, here at IADA, we, um, you know, we have a, a small but mighty staff and there's no way for us to get to all the schools. Um, and mm -hmm. so we decided to create this book to, you know, put that in, in kids' hands and, you know, start to plant those seeds about design in general. And I think, you know, thinking about architecture specifically, um, I know NOMA actually, NOMA's national chapter had a coloring book. Uh, which was a brilliant idea because it, you know, got people engaged and they were coloring, you know, uh, pictures of, of buildings um, in Nashville by uh, NOMA members. So I think, again, that early, early information is as a form of access, but then, you know, getting people to the right gu guidance counselors. In fact, there yeah. was conversation about informing guidance counselors about architecture so that they don't, um, you know, provide any misinformation. Um, and then, uh, helping people navigate the different types of programs, you know, whether you do a, a four plus two program or a five program or a four plus three program, if you want to study something as an undergrad that is not directly uh, mm -hmm. related. And so there's so many different pathways. I can understand how someone could get confused and just, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of get, get uh, sidetracked or they might look at compensation, um, you know, starting out compared to some other professions and, and make a decision based on that, which I think is unfortunate, but that also means that as a profession, we have to think about how we can best articulate our value and sort mm -hmm. of raise those numbers over time. Right. So I think a, a great goal within five years is to have a higher starting salary, which means that everyone has to be elevated to the point where, um, you know, we're really getting um, the, the compensation that that supports the value that we create. Cause again, we can see the future and not many other people can do that. Yeah. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so once someone chooses the profession, getting them into whichever academic program makes the most sense, making sure that they have, you know, the right 
um, you know, the resources to afford um, the, the technology and the books and the supplies, materials, et cetera, uh, and then connecting them with the right internship opportunities and getting them connected with mentors. Uh, that's one of the reasons why, for me, NOMA was so important um, as a student as well as AIA. And I, I wasn't directly involved with AIS as a student, but I think that's also a wonderful resource for, um, for people who are in school. And, you know, really investing time and, and energy into these organizations because they really do provide a strong and important support system to get um, into the profession and, and navigate which career opportunities make the most sense. And, I, you know, I like the idea of um, not necessarily calling it just the path to licensure because um, at the AI we've been having conversations around uh, a notion we're, we're, we're calling beyond buildings because um, you know, as architects, we're often sort of assumed to, to be designing buildings, but we're actually designing solutions that are beyond buildings. And, right. um, you know, some of, some of those things, uh, you know, are certainly done by licensed architects, but other things are, are done by those who have this, you know, really intense, uh, unique training. And I think we have to value that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's a really great point when we're, you know, you're talking about raising starting salaries, which means that fees will have to go up and things like that. And it's, it's ultimately going to come back to, and maybe it even wraps back to the grade school kids is what is the value of an architect? What, what is an architect? You know, what is, what does an architect actually do? So I love that idea of, of beyond buildings because there's, there's so much more impact that's, that's possible uh, or not even that's possible. It just happens every single day, you know, it's gonna, is what you were saying anyway. But um, uh, I, I like that. I like that approach a lot. And I know that some of the things that you care about are, you know, future of cities and and um, uh, really kind of envisioning, uh, new, well, envisioning new possibilities was, was uh, a big part of your campaign, wasn't it? It was. That was what I used as my hashtag for most of my social media posts last year during the campaign process. And, you know, I, I still, um, you know, call on people, uh, everyone, frankly, to envision new possibilities, not just for the AI, but for the profession um, and for, uh, you know, just the way that we, um, you know, conduct ourselves and the way that we um, engage with our communities, with our clients. I, I think, you know, it's time to, to look at things from a slightly different perspective. So I'm happy to, to bring, you know, my voice to the table, which, um, you know, which represents, uh, you know, some, some groups that have, uh, not long had a lot of representation. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Is, you know, you're, you're carrying the mantle as the first millennial, uh, first from the millennial generation to take this leadership role, um, what, as you think about that, how do you think leadership changes or what do you think about different leadership approaches as we move forward? Because we, we've talked about this this week. There's all, there's always, there always has been this natural shift, generational shift through leadership, right? As people get older and younger people come up, et cetera. I think we're in the first time in history with, four generations in the workplace. Um, and now you're, you're taking this mantle. Does that signal, and, and, and I, I don't know, this, this is asking for a really broad brush answer, I guess, but, but is, is there a difference in the way that you're going to think about leadership and maybe people that, um, in your generation are going to think about leadership differently things that we'll care about or talk about or act differently than, um, than has been done in the past. Sure. Well, first I'd like to say, I like all the generations. Everyone's <laughs> wonderful. Um, and, and I also, yeah, we're not, we're <laughs> not, true. I'm not trying to pit generations against generations. Yeah. Um, and I try not to make broad sweeping generalizations about, um, any group of people and yeah, certainly not yeah. generations, but, um, I will say, I, I believe that the millennial or also known as Gen Y, uh, generation, okay. um, I mean, like how generations work, we're a bridge between Gen X, mm -hmm. who are those who are a bit older than us and Gen Z, uh, those who are actually just now entering the workplace. And so I think that, um, you know, helping, our, our Gen Z counterparts kind of get adjusted to, um, you know, to sort of office culture and, and things of that nature, especially coming out of a pandemic, which, yeah. um, you know, was, was disruptive for all of us, frankly, but I think for them coming in um, and just trying to understand how all of this works. And I think that's a big part of our role in, in the uh, Gen Y millennial group. 
and then also helping Gen Xers and and Boomers understand how to to not only I think they're still trying to figure out how to work with us. Mm -hmm. um, I think they also think that we're still in our twenties, but we're actually uh, <laughs> forty plus at this point. But that's neither here <laughs> nor there. Um, but but I think it's about um, having conversations that, that that bridge those gaps and and help to create more uh, more understanding. Um, I think there's also again generally speaking. Um, more of an emphasis on sustainable design, sustainability, resilience. Um, this isn't like the greatest reason, but I think it's because of Captain Planet. Um, it's a really great cartoon. I personally watched it and was just like, you know, it's really important that we recycle, you know, like from like from being a little kid, like that was the thing. And, you know, there are other influences. Certainly that's one that comes to mind uh, first, but there are other influences that I think that we saw coming up in the 80s and 90s that sort of made it really important that we take care of the environment, we take care of one another, um, we give back, we, um, you know, we try to be philanthropic, but um, unfortunately, student loans have um, impacted millennials more than uh, actually Gen Z and Gen X, I guess there's some policy situation that mm. made that the case. So, but generally speaking, I think it's about um, people, planet, and profit. Uh, whereas I think perhaps some mm -hmm. of the um, earlier generations are a little bit more focused on profit, which makes sense. They, you know, they came, came up, um, you know, were with parents or grandparents that, um, you know, navigated the depression and, and, you know, they're just different policy things that were in place and different things happening in the world, which informs our, our worldview. So, um, so I'll, I'll leave it there, but I, I think that yeah. broad, broadly speaking, millennials are, um, still trying to figure this thing out, but doing our best to, um, you know, navigate our, uh, our peers on, on either side of us. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Um, the, w one of the things that I did not mention, I mentioned in the introduction that you are a principal at a firm, but I didn't even mention the firm. It's HOK. Uh, you're in the Chicago office at HOK. Um, the, our audience is primarily small firm architects. And so one question that naturally comes up all the time when, when, whether it's, uh, Emily, or we had Lakeisha Woods on a few weeks ago. Uh, it's, it's the question that's always going to come up is what about small firms in the future? Not only of, of AIA, you know, that's certainly in this context, but what about small firms in the future of the profession? Um, as we, you know, we, if we go over to the small firm exchange, um, website, I'll call it, uh, you've got all the statistics that are there about the, you know, the percentage of, of employees, the percentage of firms, the percentage of architects that are small firm architects. Do you see that, do you see small firms continuing to trend upwards? And if so, what's, you know, what's that mean for the future? Does it, uh, what's, what's the impact of that on the future of the profession? Yeah, I mean, I think that small firms will continue to flourish and will, um, you know, will grow and obviously become a medium sized firm and perhaps in the future, a, a larger size firm. But some some um, firm owners, uh, they intentionally want to stay small and, and sort of work in a, in a way that, um, you know, that just kind of keeps them within, you know, maybe the you know, 12 plus, uh, 12 plus or minus people range, or even sole practitioners and, and everywhere in between. And I think that there's, there's room for, for all types, because there are all types of buildings, there are all types of mm -hmm. projects, um, you know, whether they be, um, you know, built projects, and I talked about beyond buildings, but there are also some problem solving, uh, you know, uh, efforts that or opportunities out there, I think, specifically, thinking about, um, you know, uh, working in, in uh, the public public sector, um, you know, sometimes city governments will, or state governments or or what have you will put out um, RFPs, RFQs for um, community engagement, or they'll you know have like they'll pose a problem that you know architects or landscape architects or planners might be able to help with. And so I think having you know a, a wide variety of different opportunities to to leverage design services will. Um, you know, will be applied at, at different scales. And so I think small firms will always have a place in the ecosystem. Um, you know, as you mentioned, HOK is where I work. In fact, I started HOK in 2008. Uh, so I've been there for a long time, although I did take an eight year uh, period of time to do grad school and some other um, other opportunities, including teaching and, and having a small practice of my own. So I actually have some, some experience and I know how difficult it is, uh, you know, to 
to make sure that you are keeping up with cash flow, paying insurance. I didn't, I didn't have any idea how expensive insurance was, by the way, and that, you know, like those kinds of things. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I returned to HOK in 2019 as NOMA president, and um, shortly thereafter, uh, myself and a few others within the firm, we launched a, a, an initiative called HOK Tapestry. And uh, you can learn more about it at hoktapestry.com. But essentially, it's designed for us to work with smaller firms, um, you know, basically people who might uh, consult with us on a on a project. Um, and so it's a way for us to one get to know who's out in the in the community. Um, and these are firms of all types, but um, you know, we do offer the opportunity for firms to tag, you know, if they have MBE status, WBE status, VBE status, et cetera. So that, so that way we can do kind of a smart search to see who's out there, who, um, you know, has these certain certifications. Um, and even if they don't have a certification they're you know, they're in the program and we're able to, uh, to work with them on special programming that, um, you know, that, that, perhaps a large firm like HOK that's been around since 1955 can lend some expertise or uh, in some cases, some office space or, um, you know, resources of, of different types. So really excited about Tapestry and um, being able to spend some time in my new role, which was just announced this week as uh, HOK's Director of Strategic Relationships. So, um, but yeah, working closely with small firms is a, is a part of that. Um, but even if a firm does not work with HOK or another large firm, I think there's, um, there's really an important um, place for small firms in the ecosystem of design uh, design services. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations on the uh, on the new role as well. Thank you. Um, if you are, if maybe if you're listening to this or you're you're watching this, you can't see the screen. Uh, Hoktapestry.com. It's in the lower left hand corner of your screen right now, but you can go check out Tapestry that Kimberly was just talking about. Hoktapestry.com. I think I spelled that right. You got it. Thank you. <laughs> you yeah. So check that out. Um, w one of the, uh, you mentioned resilience and, um, and sustainability a few minutes ago. And I mean, we're, I mentioned when, when Scott Thrift said hi from San Francisco, how crazy it's been out there in San Francisco. I mean, we've got some, actually today, there's some major storms brewing up in the, uh, um, in kind of the, the deep South right now, um, we're in the midst of some really crazy climate action, um, we in, are. in the last, even just in the last several weeks, when you think about the future and you think about addressing climate concerns, what, what do you think about and what can we as a community of architects do? What's the best thing that we can do in order to, to start addressing those uh those types of issues yeah well one thing that comes to mind is the the 2030 challenge to to really get all of our you know um design colleagues to to figure out how to um you know to comply with with the with the, the um dynamics of the challenge um but also it reminds me and i only learned about this recently so i had to write it down to make sure i got it right so there's an architect by the name of joyce owens and yep. I don't know if you, okay, you do. Yeah, but, sure. Well, it's, it's news to me, but I'm happy to share. Um, so five of the homes that she designed in Sanibel Island, uh, they withstood Hurricane Ian, whereas all the other homes around um, were demolished. And I think that's, you know, such an important testament to, uh, you know, just the, the design skill that she has um, to, to make sure that, that those homes were, were not demolished or, you know, yeah. were not destroyed in, in that storm. And so making sure that our colleagues are equipped with the, with the skills and, and knowledge and resources that they need to, to design really resilient structures. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that the 2030 challenge, um, that I mentioned, you know, that's about long-term, um, action that, that helps with, with prevention. Um, but then also what what um, what what Joyce has been able to accomplish uh, that's sort of dealing with with the situation that we are currently in, and so I think it's a yeah. um, it's a matter of of kind of dealing with it in, in both ways. Yeah, yeah. It, for anybody that's not familiar with Joyce Owens, the reason that I know about her is because we this is going to be past tense. We used to vacation in that area, um, and where we went is annihilated at this point. Right. And so I've known about Joyce and, and known her work for a while, seeing it down there, seeing it under construction. And if, if you want an illustration of what Kimberly is talking about, just go to Instagram, 
Um, I think it says, I think her Instagram handle is, it may be JOA. So it's Joyce Owens Architect, I think. Um, but JOA, find her Instagram handle and and see these photographs. And if you've not seen any of the, the devastation of, of Sanibel and Captiva and Fort Myer, this area we're talking about in Florida, um, see the photographs of her projects and it's, it's stark. I mean, it is, it is incredible. You've got, you know, her project and the one first one that comes to my mind is this beautiful modern white home that's sitting there. Presumably if you didn't know any better in the middle of a war zone, everything else is, is just literally destroyed around it. But yet there sits, there sits her project. And it's, I, I think it's an incredible testament to her design, the quality of design and construction and all those things. Um, it's really sad. It's really sad to, to, to view it, but it is, it is a great example of the quality or, or the um, uh, um, value of an architect in, in that type of uh, that type of environment, that type of project. So um, it's funny that you brought that up because I was just talking about her in a mastermind group about an hour and a half ago. So oh, wow. yeah. 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 So, no, and I, I agree the situation itself is, is terrible. You know, what happened yeah, yeah. to so many people. Yeah. Um, but for me, there's a sense of pride that, um, you know, there's a woman architect mm -hmm. um, who, and it's women's, you know, women's month. So um, yeah, that, absolutely. that I'd highlight that, um, but yeah. just, you know, really proud of the fact that um, her work, uh, you know, in conjunction with the, uh, you know, the construction partners that, that, sure. um, yep. that were involved, you know, that it was able to sustain that kind of, um, uh, situation. So, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. um, yeah, like I said, go, go seek out some photographs of that because it's, if you ever want to point to what an architect can do, you know, it's sitting there in the middle of the, in the desolation. So, um, so yeah, I, I think it, it is, it is, um, it is on us really to think about, I, I, I think it's on us I, I was thinking earlier, sorry to, to kind of backtrack a minute, but I was thinking earlier about those, those photographs from Joyce and, and thinking about that stark difference. And there's a part of me that, that looks at that, you know, with some, with some heartstrings because that's where we used to go. But, but that it, it's such an illustration. And I think we need to do more of this to demonstrate, right? It, it's the, it's the, the show not tell, right? It's, it's the demonstrate, right. not, not tell. Uh, and of course we don't want to wish that on, on any situation, but um, I think we need to do a better job of, of highlighting the reality of what we're talking about here in the, in the value. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And one other resource I would point to is the, uh, AI framework for design excellence. Um, and so that's, you know, a resource that people can take a look at that, that gets into a lot of the, the different types of design excellence, which, which includes resilience. Yeah. Right. Right. And you can also go back and, uh, Catherine, I think this is maybe three months ago now, but we had Melissa Wackerly from AIA oh, right. on talking about sustainability at AIA. So you can, uh, go uh, watch that episode with Melissa. She had a lot of great resources to share as well. She's a wealth of knowledge, so glad she, to, be able to is, get her really. to share. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It's just every everything rattles off. It's it was impressive. Uh, good resources there. Uh, another thing that I know you focused on is um, the rapid uh, uh, rapid change in technology. Which I mean, I don't know if anybody's paying attention, but Chat G, or GPT four yeah. just was released. Yeah. Uh, in the last it's hard to keep up with all this. Yeah. It is. I mean, it's, it is. it's all happening oh. so fast. Wow, that yeah. is fast. Yeah. And and by the way, Google has uh, incorporated AI now in your Oh, Gmail. I heard about that. Yeah. So. Of course they have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. yeah, and it can actually tailor. Well, this is, that's right. We're not talking about G. I get, I get excited <laughs> about the possibilities of, I just will continue talking. Yeah, but yeah, talk about they, envision new possibilities. That I mean, I technology. Know. It's that's so exciting. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. exciting, but it's also a little scary in the sense sure. that um, if architects don't sort of get ahead of this mm. stuff, we could um, potentially lose some market share. And so, mm. I think talking about these issues now and making sure that uh, others don't sort of um, eat our lunch is is an important. Yeah important yeah. thing but i think overall the potential is there we just have to make sure we harness it appropriately yeah yeah, yeah. it'll make well, our it, lives easier i think yeah it, yeah and i think 
you know, to me, as long as we look at these things as tools, right? Because that's what they are. As long as we look at these things as tools and learn to use the tools, you know, that'll, that'll be to the distinct advantage, but it's, you know, for all everybody out there that's designing, uh, in wood construction, you know, you're, you're not going to tell the carpenter that they can only swing a hammer, right? That they have pneumatic nailers and, um, other, other more advanced, I guess you could say it that way, more advanced tools, right. That they've adapted to. And, um, that's a very basic example, obviously, but, um, but what, what other types of, I mean, AI is, it's, you know, that's the, on the tip of everybody's tongue right now, but what else do you see in terms of advancing technologies that you're thinking about? I think also the metaverse is something to be mindful of and how that works and how architects can get engaged. And, um, and the other thing, um, which isn't directly related, but there it's sort of tangential. Um, there are many students who are studying architecture and taking uh, classes, um, you know, in the engineering building that, um, you know, that are related to information sciences, et cetera. And some of them are getting very comfortable over there um, and getting poached by companies that are not architecture firms. And so we're losing some of our talent uh, to, to those groups. And so I think, um, you know, it's, it's not wrong of an architecture student to expand their horizons. I've certainly spent some time outside of traditional architecture um, but I think that, you know, as a profession, we have to probably provide some opportunities for more immersion in technology or emerging mm -hmm. technologies in particular to, to kind of keep the interest of some of our young people who um, are curious about what's what's happening, you know, over in, in, um, yeah. in Silicon Valley. So, yeah. so that, that comes to mind. Yeah, that, that was one of the things I, I taught an undergrad section of pro practice for the first time last semester. And um one of the things that really struck me, I, I asked, you know, I wanted to get to the heart of what these students were thinking about in terms of their future. You know, what do, you, what do they think about in terms of the profession? What do they think about in terms of their career, their life? You know, all of these things, you've touched on a lot of them, right? The, the cost, cost of education, debt, you know, all of those things, salaries, um, future workplace, things like that. And w one day, we were talking about what they were really interested in, you know, sort of types of jobs that they were interested in um, within or outside of the profession, you know, left that, that door open for them. And a majority of the students, and this is a small sample, right? It's 27 students or something like that. So it's a pretty small sample, but, but the majority of them said that they were interested in exploring something besides the traditional architecture practice. And so you had people talking about renderings and, and different, you know, visualization sort of technologies, um, uh, building envelope designers. And, you know, so I was impressed by some, you know, these are fourth year students it's like, okay, you've been exposed to some, yeah. some things that I didn't know about in my you know fourth year. Yeah. Um, um, but, but that really struck me that a lot of these students said, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sold on the idea of traditional architecture practice, um, with at least the desire to explore other things that are out there. Yeah. I certainly encourage young people. Uh, I mean, I did this myself. I've had, um, many different jobs over the course of my career and, you know, sampling different things to see what, yeah. what makes the most sense, what makes uh, what makes you happy, like what's most fulfilling. Yeah. And so certainly trying those things out. But um, I would encourage folks to give traditional practice a try mm -hmm. just to at least know what know what it is and know what it's about. Um, and, you know, the experience will certainly vary from firm to firm and, right. and you know, different firm cultures, um, you know, might might impact one's decision to stay or, or, or move along. But um, but definitely just having that information about what's what's out there is, is going to help. Yeah. Um, you know, help someone figure out what, where they probably would be most successful long-term. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's an excellent point. You, you've always got to bring that up with students, whether it's undergrad or grad, because at, at that point in their life, they have such a small, um, yeah. small window of exposure and, and, you know, I don't know what I don't know, and they certainly don't know what they don't know. Um, so find, finding a place that feels like home, I think, and, and feels, um, uh, you know, accepting to you that that's one thing that, that a lot of these students were, 
were uh, concerned about was, hey, they, they've heard stories, right? They they okay. saw the the Cyark panel debacle, um, things like that, and they they hear that and they're worried about that in terms of of the workplace. You know, am I going to be thought of like that or treated like that? Or, um, and some of it comes down to the right fit, and some of it comes down to um, us as professionals behaving behaving badly or not, I th- in, in my opinion. Um, but I think there are legitimate, uh, um, concerns in that they don't, they don't know what they're headed into. Um, how, how do we, how do we give the future generation of architects? How do we give them the feeling or reassure them that there is going to be a place here where you do belong? Um, where, you know, you, you can build a career that you can also have a family that, um, you know, all of these things that, that I think many of us have aspired to when we were young, hopefully achieved as we've gotten older, but, but is there a key to, um, to, to, um, facilitating those dreams or is it, is it just some natural thing that has to happen? I don't know. Well, sort of how I kicked off uh, my remarks uh, earlier, it's, it's for me, the key has been mentorship. And, you know, I tell everyone who, um, you know, I have the opportunity to to chat with about my career. Um, you know, I wouldn't be here without uh, right. the great mentors that I've had, people who have, um, you know, just told me that you should apply for this job or, you know, there's an opening here, you should strongly consider it. Um, you know, those are the kinds of things that, um you know, based on their understanding of you and what you've articulated uh, that you're interested in. And also, it's important to be clear about what you want or things that you, um, you know, have an interest in, in seeing out and then uh, making sure that your network um, is aware of that so that when those things do come around, um, others will will think to, to tap you for those. But, I, you know, I certainly credit my mentors from, um, from NOMA, from AIA, from, from HOK and, and other places, um, you know, for helping to kind of guide me through all the the various things that I've I've done throughout my career, um, and so I think asking questions and um, and also being a mentor too, because um, there's a lot of good information from those who are coming coming behind you. So I think yeah. I, I, I like to call it 360 mentorship. Mm, yeah, yeah, I like that. We've talked about mentorship some on context and clarity, and that that idea has come up. Right, it's it's not just a uh, it's not just an older person mentoring a younger person. Um, there, there's lots of, whether, whether you call it two way or 360, there's lots of opportunity in, uh, in all directions. I think that's yeah. a, that's a really good point. Are you familiar with the Dan Sullivan question? Have you ever heard that? I have not. We're getting into the marketing weeds here or sales weeds at this point, but Dan Sullivan is this, um, I, I'm going to call him sort of this marketing guru guy. And he, there's actually a book now called the Dan Sullivan question. But the question goes something like, imagine yourself three years from today. Um, I'll paraphrase it, but imagine yourself three years from today and you look around and go, this is great. This has been a success. I'm happy with where I am. And then looking back from three years from today, back to today, what will have had to have happened over the course of those three years in order to make that true? So let's, let's modify that a little bit for your case. Okay. In... At, at the end of 2024, your time as the 100th president of AIA will be coming to a close. So imagine yourself in December, mid-December of 2024, looking back, what will have had to have happened over the course of your year as president of AIA for you to say, this, this is this is what I dreamed it would be, or this is, this has been very successful. I'm, I'm so glad that, that, uh, this happened in this way. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I've definitely been spending some time thinking about good. things along <laughs> those lines. So yeah. not completely off guard here. Um, you know, I, I really want, uh, the profession of architecture to be elevated significantly in the, in the sort of public eye. Like I want people to mm-hmm. know, um, what architects do, um, you know, I actually, we, uh, we went to Capitol Hill uh, as AI for AI Leadership Summit last month, and uh, we got to meet with uh, some lawmakers and, and their staffers. And one of the questions that I asked, I think, in every uh, group that I um, got to meet with, what's your favorite building? And most 
regular people, as in non-architects, they don't know. Um, mm. They don't know what their favorite building is, nor would they know the architect. And so I'd love right. it if um, there is heightened awareness of, of um, buildings in general, like the names of buildings. Um, certainly, yeah. it'd be great to know the architects of those buildings. And so I'd love it if... Um, you know, as you're flipping through magazines, you start to see those things noted because, you know, they're pretty good at um, putting the photographer's name. And I'm like, what building is this? Who's the architect? Like, I'd yeah. like for us to, you know, get a little bit more credit for the incredible amount of work that goes into creating these buildings. Um, so I mean, just generally um, raising the profile of the architect. And so the, um, the, the work that will need to happen between now and then is uh, really getting out there, telling our stories, you know, going mm -hmm. on um, social media and, you know, the more traditional media channels and just um, letting the public know what we do, the value that we create. Um, and, you know, certainly it would be too early to, to um, see this come to fruition by the end of 2024. Sure. But, you know, I'd love to see those starting salaries become more competitive with other um, with other choices that young people have, so that more people will choose architecture, and it's a more complicated uh, answer than than I would have time, or actually right now the full understanding to um, to address. But there are a lot of dynamics at play in you know how uh, you know how we value our services, and um, and I think um, and also just generally the value that other people see, at, you know when when they think of an architect, and so. Um, so I think we have to work on that and, and kind of get our messaging straight and and um, put it out there in a clear way so that our clients are like, oh, absolutely, this invoice makes sense. Like, do you want more? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What do you need more? Um, yeah. yeah. And also just one last thing on that topic, um, improving the procurement process for design services. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the work that I have been doing up until my new role uh, started this week um, is I've, I've been marketing principal in the Chicago studio of HOK and myself and my colleagues from around the firm. And also I know other firms deal with this too, um, receiving RFPs, RFQs, and, and other types of requests with very short turnaround times. You know, we had something that was due on December 27th, which is, you know, problematic for so many reasons. Um, even things due on Monday, it's like, you know, cause then, you know, people are going to be working over the weekend and just kind of, um, making sure that there are clear guidelines that um, that treat us with a level of respect as mm -hmm. professionals. Um, I think sometimes these RFPs and RFQs read like they're, you know, they're purchasing paper clips and it's like, no, we are professionals and we, you know, it takes time to put these, uh, these packages together. So um, really, I think improving the procurement service um, or the procurement professional services mm -hmm. process yeah. would be something that I would like to to say we accomplished over over that that year of yeah. my presidency i'm with you we could we backstage we could talk for a couple of hours about that <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's something everyone can relate to for yeah. sure yeah yeah absolutely the, the, those are those are a couple of really or a few really great goals there i like i like all of those and and i think everybody in this community anybody that's watching this either now or in the future could get on board with uh, with all of those, so I know we're close to the top of the hour here. Again, a, a uh, an audience of of small firm, primarily small firm architects from across the country. I don't know if I've seen any international friends pop in here uh, today or not. But but as you think about small firm architects or, or, or any architects, but you know this is this is our community. Um, what's one thing? that you would love it if every small firm architect in this community and beyond would start doing, um, would start doing today? Uh, I would encourage everyone to know your value and demand it. And if a client doesn't want to pay that, then maybe they're not the right client for you and kind of like stick to your guns as much as possible. I know that's easier said than done, but I think as a profession, we have to do that consistently. Um, like across the board, all sizes, all scales, like, um, you know, you, you get what you ask for, generally speaking. And um, I think we have to, to be a little bit more um, generous with ourselves and understanding that our time, I mean, it's, it takes on average um, 12 years for someone to become an architect, or at least that was a stat that, that I memorized a little while ago. Maybe the number has adjusted a little bit. It takes a long time, basically, yeah. Um, yeah. over a decade, roughly. And, um, 
you know, you work really hard to, to earn that and all of your colleagues, you know, around you also did. And so I think it's important to make sure that, um, that you are, um, you know, earning, uh, you know, your, your, your fees reflect that so that, you know, you can actually continue to do that work and hire the best talent and keep the best talent. And so I think just being really confident in the services that you provide that's really important and the extent to which you need support or um or you know just generally want to connect with others to to understand something that you don't know as much about go to AIA go to NOMA go to you know other organizations like ULI or depending on what you know what you're directly engaged in get involved locally um or nationally or or internationally but you know i think it's important to kind of build community around yourself not just for your firm but also um, with with other firms, with other sole practitioners, with other large firms, like whatever the case might be, just building um, that network around you is really important. Yeah. I think that's been one of the um, the key things that's helped me, um, you know, in addition to my mentors, which is kind of included in that group. Sure, sure, yeah. I, I think that's a good point. It it always, um, you know, I love that idea of building the community around you, and I I also think I'm I'm going to maybe spin this in a different direction, perhaps, but. But I also think that, you know, none of us, none of us are on an island. None of us are insulated from any of this thing. We all bear some responsibility. You know, we can't look at, um, you know, this organization or that organization and say, oh, they ought to be doing this because we have just, just you know, back to Joyce Owens and, and the way, and she's sort of been on, on a, a speaking trail a little bit over the past couple of months too, talking about the situation uh, down there on the Gulf coast of Florida in the houses and, and everything else. Um, she's taking that on, right? She's, she's carrying that. Does it have some benefit for her? Certainly it does. Does it have a wider benefit for architects? Absolutely. It does. Um, and, and the ripple effect will, will no doubt be great. And so, you know, I think everybody needs to think about their own ripple effect and, and not say, Hey, you know, what's, what's AIA doing or what's NOMA doing or what's, you know, the rest of the alphabet soup doing for me. Right. Um, so, uh, so I, those are, uh, those are some really great points. Kimberly, first of all, congratulations on Thank 10 you. years, 10 Thank years. That, that's, that's an important one. Congratulations awesome. on being the 100th. That's, that's, so much. that's, that's pretty huge. big. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. thank you for being with us on our 100th. Yeah. Congrats uh, to you. Yeah, thank you. We we appreciate that uh, that synergy there. And uh, so, those of you that that don't know this, you don't get the you don't get to see the backside of planning and things like that. I tried to talk her out of it. <laughs> I, I tried to tell her no, you don't need to to reschedule to make this happen. But I, I appreciate. I was determined. <laughs> I was like, no, I'm going to make your 100th episode. Oh, no, I appreciate that. Thank you um, for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's great to have you here. It really is. We we appreciate the support. Um, as we look forward to next week, our Context and Clarity Live guest next week will be KP Reddy, the founder of Shadow Ventures. So we'll probably talk about the funding of architecture, the funding of architecture projects and firms and technology. So join us next week, next Thursday. Um, I don't know. What is that? The 23rd, if I'm doing my math correctly. Um, Sounds right. Yes. <laughs> So join us Thursday, uh, March 23rd at 4 p.m. Eastern in all of these places to talk to uh, KP Reddy. Look, I hate to be the one to point this out, but you also have 100th on the next thing. So are we going to be right here? We're we're just going to, we're going to stick with 100. (laughs) Every, every year, we're not going to get older than 100. That's it. We're never going to get beyond 100. (laughs) Timeless. Love it. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Sorry. I need an editor for that. Yeah. Um, so KP ready Sorry, next week, but uh, this week, thank you very much. Kimberly is great. It's a great conversation. Glad to have you here. Um, keep promoting butter pecan ice cream. Yeah. Uh, yes. That's awesome. Something out with the booklets to all the kids at the school. We have to make thinking, sure yeah. that it lives on. So. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, save, save butter, butter pecan. That's uh that'll be your next hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that when you're finished leading the AIA. So. Right. In 2025, okay. I'll work on that. Right. right. Yeah, so. yeah. There you go. Yeah. You'll need, you'll need something to do by then. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, absolutely. thanks again for having me.
Yeah, absolutely. Great to have you. And for all of you out there, I know I say this every week, but thank you because if it weren't for you, right, if it weren't for you showing up and um, keeping this going, we're, we're almost to the three-year mark of of uh, context and clarity here. So if it weren't for you showing up, we would not be having this conversation with Kimberly today. So thank you for making this uh, a possibility. And as always, be well, stay safe, keep those around you safe and well, find a little bit of time to breathe, and relax, find a way to rejuvenate because we do this every day. You've got to pace yourself. Thanks for going on the journey and we'll see you again tomorrow. And Thanks, envision everybody. new possibilities. Envision new possibilities. Always Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Bye.